All right, welcome to section 3.2, quadratic functions and graphs. Okay, so we have quadratic functions and the general form is p of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c, where a, b, and c are real numbers and a is not equal to zero. So one of the main things to notice about quadratics again is you have an x squared and that's the only square that you see. The other x is to the power of one. So that would be a quadratic. Now the graph of a quadratic function, we call it a parabola. Usually these would have the little arrowheads on the end to let you know it goes on to infinity. And then again, we have opening up and opening down. This one right here is opening up. And the leading term is positive, positive x squared. So opening up again, think of a happy face. You're feeling some positive vibes, opening up. And these would have their vertex down here, which would be a minimum. Okay. so. Parabolas that open upwards do not have a maximum number, they just have a minimum. Because again, this goes on to infinity, so there's no going to be a maximum number. If we take a look at the next one, opening downwards is going to have or comes from a negative x squared value. So the leading coefficient would be negative. And this one, the vertex, is going to be its maximum. That's the highest number possible. But notice, would we have a minimum? No, we would not have a minimum value. So again, parabolas facing downwards have a maximum, parabolas facing upwards have a minimum. Now, I've been talking about the vertex and how do we find the vertex? Well, if we're given the generic form for a parabola, we can find the x and y values for a vertex because again, it's a point. The vertex is a point. We have an x value, which we find taking the b value, dividing it by 2a, and then the y value, you just plug this number right here, whatever you find, you plug it into the formula, and then you would solve for the number. Let's see, so example one, let's graph p of x equals negative three x squared plus six x minus five, state the axis of symmetry, domain, and range. So at this point, usually I'm going to request that you plot at least three points for each parabola that you make and then whatever is asked over here. So first let's go ahead and find the vertex. Before I do that though, I'll go ahead and do step one. Let's list the ABC values. My A value is negative three. So again, do I know if my parabola is opening up or down? How would I know that? It's based on the leading A value. It's a negative, which means my parabola is gonna open down. So when you're doing this again, please go ahead and note that the parabola is opening down. B value does not have too much of a meaning on it. It just helps me find the vertex. And then my C value is negative five. And my C value is going to be something special. It's my Y intercept. Because when I plug zero in for X, all of these values are gone and just my C is left. So that's the point zero, negative five. Let's go ahead and plot that. Zero, negative five. And let's go ahead and find the vertex now. So we have our A, B, and C values. We can find a vertex, so step two. It's gonna be vertex. So my V sub X value, which is the X value for the vertex, again is negative B over two A. And what is my B value? It is six. My A value is negative three. And then simplifying that, that's gonna come down to a positive one. So my x value is a one. Again, how do we find my y value? We're gonna use our original function above and plug in our newfound x value, which is one. We'll plug that in wherever we see x. So it's me, uh, let's see. Negative three times my new x value plus six minus five, one and one. So V sub Y is gonna be, when I simplify that out, it's gonna be negative two. So Y, or a vertex is gonna be one, negative two. Oops, zoom in, one, negative two. And I can just go ahead, label it V, and that would be fine for a vertex. You could label the coordinate point, but I'm fine with V. Now, we need to find the third point. How would I find the third point? Well, that's gonna come from something called the axis of symmetry. Parabolas are neat because they're symmetric, smack down the vertex. So there's this line that goes straight through the vertex, 
called the axis of symmetry. And what this line means is that if there is a number one unit away from the vertex, or the axis of symmetry, on one side, that means there must be another number, or another point, exactly one unit away on the other side. So by the axis of symmetry, we know that this point exists here to negative 5. And we have found the third point, again, based on the axis of symmetry. But we need to state what it is. So the axis of symmetry. Well, we just take the y value, or the x value, of our vertex, which is 1. Again, right here, and it's that line x equals 1. And that is our axis of symmetry. All right, so we just got to go ahead and graph in our line. All right, and then let's see, what is our domain and range? Domain, again, is all the x values we're using. Well, since we have these infinity, positive infinity, or sorry, negative infinity and negative infinity, we're going to be using all real numbers for the x. How about the range, though? The range we use, let's see, all of these values here, but then, boop, we stop right here at negative 2. We don't go any further up on the y values. So the range is negative infinity to negative 2, and we're done. Let's see, go ahead and box our vertex. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to the standard form. So again, the other form we had was the general form, which isn't as useful as the standard form. What is useful about the standard form for quadratic? The useful thing is, if it's in this form, we can easily see and pick out our vertex. We don't have to do the whole formula if it's in this form. And how do we get it in this form? Well, we need to complete the square. And then we can get it in this beautiful form where we can easily pick off, again, our vertex values. All right, so we're given our equation, and it's not in vertex form. How do I know? Well, it's in general form. We have our x squared first, then our regular x value, and 1. So we need to do completing the square, because again, if we do completing the square, we're going to have our nice binomial squared. And that is our goal, to get a binomial squared. In order to do that, we need to find the perfect number to add to this function that'll do that. And again, we have to be careful when we're adding something to our function, we have to make sure we're not changing it. So we have to be sneaky. If we add it, we have to subtract some version as well. So in essence, we're adding zero. And you'll see what I mean in a second. To find the perfect number, first we need to get our x squared by itself, which means we need to factor out that too. And I'm actually, actually before I do that, I'm going to go ahead and group my x terms by themselves, and I'll leave that one term alone. The one term is not going to be helping us, so we'll just put it out on the side. And again, my goal is to add something here that when I factor it, it'll give me a perfect square binomial. But again, we need to have our x squared by itself, so let's go ahead and factor out that too. All right, so we factored out that too. The x squared is by itself, positive 1. So now we need to determine what number if I added it to my function, would create a perfect square trinomial that I could factor. Well, in order to find that, we'll go ahead and use the sort of the formula. Again, if you ever want to know how that works, you could set up a zoom time with me and I can explain it. But again, you take your b value, then you're going to divide it by 2, and then square it. So 2 divided by 2 is going to be 1, and then we'll square that 1, which is just going to be 1. And that number right there, that positive 1, that is the perfect number that when we add it to our function, it'll factor beautifully. Okay, again, we're trying to make it so it factors beautifully. So I'm going to go ahead and add that number 1, but careful. If I add a number 1 for no reason, I have changed my problem. So I have to find a way to balance it out. Oh, I forgot to bring down this other plus 1 from above. Okay, so I've added 1, but have I really added 1? Remember, we have this 2 multiplying. So if I was to multiply out that 2, we've actually technically added 2 to our problem. So in order to balance it out, because I've added a 2, I have to go ahead and subtract 2 on this side. So in the end, if you were multi multiplying this out, 
we'd have technically added zero because the positive two from here, again, remember we distribute because of these parentheses, that positive two would cancel with the negative two, so we haven't actually done anything. Again, just being sneaky, changing the form. Sort of genius. All right, so when we do that, this perfect square trinomial will perfectly factor into x plus one squared. And then these guys, that's gonna be a negative one. So now, is this in the perfect um, vertex form? It is, we have the x minus something squared plus another number. So we have to be careful. Notice in the original form, it's a minus h. Now we have a plus one. So you basically have to take the opposite to get your h value for your vertex. So what's the opposite of a positive one? Well, the opposite of a positive one is gonna be a negative one. And then for my y value, you don't have to really change the sign at all. It's exactly what is there, which would be another negative one. And there we go, we have our vertex. So negative one, negative one, right over here. And again, I'll just label it with a V. So now, again, we just need two other points for graphing. And we're not told to find um, any other value. So let's go ahead and just find the y-intercept, see if we have one. And then we can use the axis of symmetry to find the third point. So my y-intercept, again, is just the c-value, because when I plug in 0 for x, these values will all disappear. And we're just left with that positive 1. So my y-intercept is 0, positive 1. Ready, right here, zero positive one. We need to find our third point, and again, we can find our third point using the axis of symmetry, which goes directly through our vertex at x equals negative one. So since we have a number one unit away here, that means we know there must exist a number or a point one unit away in this direction, again, by the axis of symmetry. And that point there is negative two, one. Alrighty, and we're done. We have our three points, so we'll go ahead and graph that out. And there we have it. All right, let's take a look at example three. We're gonna complete the square on that and then graph. So again, the goal for completing the square, you're gonna group the x terms, factor out whatever you need to get x squared by itself, find that number with a special sort of formula I showed you, the perfect number to add into our problem, and then continue on from there. So let's see, I need to box or group the x terms. Well, actually notice, we don't have a term that doesn't have an x. That's okay. And now again, we need to get x by itself. So let's go ahead and factor out that negative four. And now my goal, I need to find that perfect number to add to this, that'll make it factor beautifully. Well, again, how do we do that? Well, we just take the middle term, the b value, which is a negative one. We're gonna divide it by two and then square it like we did last time. Well, that's gonna be negative half and then a negative half squared is gonna end up equaling a fourth. So again, let's go ahead and add a fourth to my problem. However, careful, if I just add that fourth and I don't do anything else, I've changed my problem. So we have to balance it out since we added a fourth on the inside, we have to subtract something. But remember, because of these parentheses, that negative fourth is going to be multiplying to the one fourth. So what really did I add? I really added a negative one. So how would I balance out adding a negative one? I'll just add a positive one. So again, I'm adding this positive one to balance out what I just added into the problem here. And now I haven't actually technically changed my problem. I've manipulated it a little, but I haven't really changed it. So again, it's gonna look like this. And now because we did that nifty thing, this is a perfect square trinomial, which is gonna factor into x minus that value before we squared it. All right, so now this is in the perfect vertex form. Again, my x value is going to be the opposite of what's in here. The opposite of a negative half is going to be a positive half. And then my y value is just whatever's right here. 
that's going to be a positive one. Again, the x value, you take the opposite. The y value, you don't. So that'll be my vertex. It's going to be half positive 1. Now, I just need to find my two other points. So again, my plan is going to be find my y-intercepts and then use the axis of symmetry to find the remaining point that I need. So my y-intercept, again, if I plug in 0 for these, what's my y-intercept? Oh, there is no number there. Well, that means it's going to be 0. So my y-intercept is at the point 0, 0. Let's see, go ahead and plug in that in. Now, how do I find the remaining number that I need? Well, again, we have the axis of symmetry. Going along right here, right through the vertex again. At x equals a half. So, again, we could find a reflected point. We have one that goes a half a unit this way, which means there must exist one that's a half a unit that way. And this would be the point 1, 0. Alrighty, and, and we got to draw that in. And there you have our parabola. Okay, alrighty, moving along. Now we're taking a look at circles. Alrighty, so circles. Circles is a set of points, x, y, with a distance r from the point hk. Where hk is, let's see, let me change the pen. hk is our center, r is our radius. And we have two different forms. We have the center radius form, which is nice, because again, I can just pull off my center and my radius. And then we have the general form, which is not really as useful. But notice, for circles, my x is squared and my y is squared. And they both have the same number in front, which in this case is a 1. So that's how you can tell a circle. So let's see, example 4, graph. So when I'm graphing a circle, all I need is the center and the radius. And this is perfectly set up in center radius form. So for my center, got to be careful, we're taking the opposite of what's inside the square, just like we kind of did with the parabola. However, this time, my y is also in parentheses. So we're going to take the opposite of both the x and the y. So the opposite of negative 2 and the opposite of positive 3. So what is that going to be? That is going to be 2 negative 3. And then what's my radius? Okay, so careful. You might be tempted to say the radius is 4, but again, remember, the radius squared is that number. So this means that r squared must equal 4. But I don't want to know my radius squared. I want to know my radius. So we'll solve for a radius. That'll cancel. And r is plus or minus 2, but we can't have a negative radius, so we'll just take r equals 2. So easiest way to plot this, at least for me, that I found is first plot the center. So that's going to be 2, negative 3. And I'll just label it with a C for center. And then we're going to plot the radius, two units. Um, let's see, north, south, east, and west. So up 2 at this point right here, which is 2, negative 1. Left 2, let's see, that's going to be the point 0, negative 3. Down 2, 1, 2. 2, negative 5, and then right to 1, 2, 4, negative 3. Once you've done that, it's a little easier to draw in your circle. It doesn't have to be perfect. Notice that looks not that great. So again, you could try it out again if you wanted to. But I'm not super picking the circles because I know they're kind of hard to draw. Alrighty, and there we go our somewhat circle. I'm not going to try to spend too much time on trying to make this look beautiful. Here we go, our circle. All right. Okay, so our circle, radius 2, centered at the point 2, negative 3. So now, lastly, let's take a look at example 5. We need to graph it. And to graph, again, we need the center and the radius. However, this is in standard, or the general form. I don't want it in general form. I want it in center radius form because then I can easily see my center and my radius. How do we do that? Well, again, whenever we see something square like this, we should be thinking of the completing the square property. So again, we're going to have to complete the square not only once, but twice 
on the x value and then on the y value. But we can do this. Alrighty, so let's see. When I'm completing the square, my first thing, I want to get the x's grouped together, the y's grouped together, and then the thing that doesn't have a variable on the other side. So we'll add this 4 to the other side to get it out of the way, and then we're going to group the y's together, and then group the x's together. And I'm going to leave room for that number that we're going to add in. Remember, we want to add in that perfect number to make a perfect square trinomial. Okay, so again, we're trying to find that number to add in to each of these to make it factor perfectly. How do we do that? Well, remember, we just take that center value, divide it by 2, and square it. So that's going to be 2 squared, which is 4. So for my x values, 4 is that perfect number. So I'll go ahead and add in 4. However, I've added a 4. Now, because this isn't just a function, this is a left-hand side and a right-hand side of my equation, I'm going to treat it a little differently than I did before. I added 4 on the left-hand side, so I'm going to go ahead and subtract 4. Or sorry, I'm going to go ahead and add 4 to the other side to balance it out. You have to add 4 to both sides. Okay. To balance it out. And then, again, for the y values, how are we going to do this? Well, we take that middle value, the b value, divide it by 2 and square it. That'll be negative 1 squared, which is 1. So the perfect number to add into this would be 1. But again, I cannot change the true part of my equation, so I have to balance it. I added 1 to one side of the equation, you got to add 1 to the other side. Remember to balance your equation. So now, if we did this right, these two trinomials should factor perfectly into nice little binomials squared. So this first one becomes x plus 2 times x plus 2. Plus, and the second one becomes x, uh, y minus 1 times y minus 1 equals 9. And again, since these are duplicates, we can write them as x plus 2 squared plus y minus 1 squared equals 9. Aha! Now it is in that perfect form to find my center and my radius. So again, remember my center, we take the opposites of the h and the k values. So opposite of positive 2 opposite of negative 1, so that's going to be negative 2, positive 1. Mm -hmm. And then remember my radius squared equals the 9 value. So we have to solve for r, so r is going to equal 3. So my center is at the point negative 2, 1. We'll call that c, and then again my radius is 3. So we're going to count up 3, right 3, left 3, down 3. 1, 2, 3 negative 2, 4, 1, 2, 3, 1, 1, 1, 2, 3, negative 2, negative 2, 1, 2, 3, negative 5, let's see, negative 5, 1. And there we have our circle. Attempting my best to make it look like a circle. Yeah, somewhat. Okay. Again, it doesn't matter if your circle is perfect, it should look somewhat like a circle. Alrighty, and that is it for this section. Um, let me know if you have any questions, please email me, we can set up a Zoom hour. If you do email me a question, please again send me a screenshot of what you're working on, that way I get an idea on what you're attempting and where you might be getting stuck. Alrighty, that is it for this section.